President, fellows and guests. While we're waiting for this to sharpen up, I'll just give a brief introduction. I'm very honoured to have been admitted as a fellow of the Society this afternoon and to have been asked to, div to deliver a lecture. My talk will fall into two parts. First, I will give a description and outline of the various aspects of this project. And then I will trace the development of domestic buildings in castle towns and the countryside of North West Wales. And in conclusion, I will indicate the key findings of the project and its legacy. First of all, don't be alarmed, but you'll notice that the title is bilingual. This is because in North West Wales, the majority of, of people are first language Welsh speakers. And I shall be speaking in English this afternoon, although sometimes I do give talks in Welsh. Second thing to note is that we have two titles. We started the project with the title the North West Wales Dendrochronology Project because it seemed fitting as we were going for grants for the scientific aspect of the project. But as we realised that we were going to be working with communities up and down North West Wales, it really wasn't the right title. So we quickly adopted Dating Old Welsh Houses as a far more understandable title. The project has been of three years duration and we are extremely grateful to this society for grants received each of those three years towards the scientific aspects of the project. Perhaps I should say now that I am not a professional dendrochronologist nor a professional architectural historian nor professional anything in this field really but a serious amateur of history and archaeology in North West Wales over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, technology is defeating me. Right. Here we have a timber framed house. That's obvious. But when I give talks, People expect me to be talking about stone-walled, slate-roofed houses. They came much later. And in North West Wales, as in most of the United Kingdom, the earliest surviving houses are timber-framed. This particular solar wing of an undateable hall house is situated in Beaumaris on the Isle of Anglesey and the timbers in this solar dated to the 1480s. The project has four aims. The first has been to discover, sample and date using dendrochronology, original timber that's suitable for this technology uh, from houses of the pre-1600 pre period. And here we have a member of the Oxford Dendrochronology Laboratories team working in a house in um, the Vale of Clwyd, a crook frame, oak timber, all the work we did has been in oak. And here he is using a steel hollow drill to extract sample. We will come back to a picture of the exterior of this house, but the timber was dated to 1501. Now that's the felling date, because timber was used unseasoned. I don't know if you've ever tried to knock a nail into a very seasoned piece of oak. It's not easy. In fact, it's almost impossible. And because these timbers, once cut, needed to be fitted with uh, mortise and tenon joints and holes for pegs and so on, they were used unseasoned and gathered and used to erect the building within a year or two of the felling date. 
So I will be giving you selling dates. The second aim was to record the, the architecture, particularly of the woodwork. We hoped we might come across schools of master carpenters moving across North Wales or examples of different particular styles uh, in either geographical areas or across time. But we haven't yet had the time to analyse all the results to work out whether we have come up with that sort of data. Here we have on the left Richard Suggett from the Royal Commission on Ancient and Historic Monuments of Wales, with whom the partner that the project was in partnership. And he is a senior investigator of historic buildings and has been extremely helpful. On the right is Dr. Dan Miles from the Oxford Dendro Chronology Unit um, Laboratories, who were awarded the contract for all the dendro chronology. The work of doing the building recording was awarded to about four different regionally uh, acknowledged experts in building recording. So again, it brought some, um, some jobs to the area. This is the outside cover of one of the reports on a uh, house dated to 1537 in the area near, near Better Sequoid. These reports, as well as containing a lot of text and photographs, had plans and elevations. This is of a remote farm, uh, the first phase dated to 1520s. The third aim was to record the history of the houses. This was mainly done through the history of the people who lived within those houses, owners and tenants. I gave innumerable talks to societies across North Wales about three years ago, gathering support. There were notices in libraries, things in the media, and so on. And we had a lot of interest. So we ran about half a dozen introductory days in local archives, in which volunteers came to hear about the project in detail and what might be asked of them. And here in the afternoon session, we have one of the local archivists and education officer for Gwynedd showing the group some of the documents. In this case, it's a half tax. What original documents they could look at to see if they can track down information about the early period of the house they had chosen to study. These groups in six areas met every month and in fact one group split into two groups so we had eight groups meeting every month across North Wales. Here's one happy band. About half of these are first language Welsh speakers and they could choose which language they used to do their research and to write up their report. Um, I was personally quite glad that most of them decided to write them up in English. These monthly meetings were for mutual support, for education into more ways in which they might find house history details and also just a general jollying along and encouragement. But they've been a magnificent group in, in all the areas. Fourth aim was to share the results. I suppose that's partly what I'm doing this afternoon. Here is a group in uh, near St Asaph towards the beginning of the uh, period when I'm still looking for new volunteers. Cheerful band of archaeologists in the whole. Don't think practicing looking at them, but never mind, never mind. And this was last spring, a bilingual conference on heritage in North Wales, uh, and we had an hour slot to talk about the project there. Here we have a proud owner showing a group of volunteers features in his house, which was mainly of the 16th and early 17th century. Why was the project necessary? I used to show another picture of this house, but in the snow of about 18 months ago, the roof fell in. It's a listed building, but it hasn't done it much good, has it? So one of the aims has been to record and where possible date 
these old houses that look as though they're on their last legs, so that there are recordings for, for posterity. Another reason has been because we genuinely wanted to increase the database of knowledge and understanding about the development of vernacular architecture in North Wales, and we hope to pass this on to planning officers so they will have better information from which to make decisions about modernisation requests. All houses are being modernised over the centuries, but some ways are more appropriate than others. How do we do this work? Well, many of you will recall from nature study, at least, if not from later experience, that you can easily see the annual growth rings on a cross-section of a piece of timber, and that the width of that tree ring varies according to the nutrients, water, shelter, the various um, things that will help the tr tree grow better or just struggle to survive. If one, ha <laughs> if one has a timber, as this one, perhaps a small joist in the ceiling, all you can say about the date of a timber felled that's this size is that it must have been felled after that particular annual growth ring. Therefore, it's a date after which the tree that was felled, a terminus postquem date. If you're using a larger piece of timber for sampling and you're into the sapwood, you then have a felling date range, usually of about 30 years. If you're fortunate, probably up in the roof, you've found a much larger timber, perhaps with bark edge, then you may well get a precise felling date. Sometimes, because of the variation in the molecular structure through the seasons of the year, you're able to give a season as well. And not unsurprisingly, we found that a considerable number of the timbers dated were felled in the winter, which makes perfect sense. The trees have lost their leaves and the rural community has a little more time for this sort of activity. However, we were um, saddened to find there were a large number of lovely timbers we were not able to date. They were mainly low-lying maritime situations where the trees had just grown so well, so fast, that the annual growth rings were wide and there were an insufficient number of them within the piece of wood that we had. And so we couldn't match up this variation of fats and things in the annual growth rings, which are a bit like um, the, the information you get when you go into a supermarket, the barcode, and that is then matched against the regional database. We couldn't do it because we didn't have a unique signature. So that was a great, a great disadvantage. In other cases, it might have been because the woodlands had been managed and trees had been pollarded or other, other things had been done, so when we were not getting a true reading. Here at the top, we have um, a rejected sample. That's why I got it. That was no good. Below it is a longer sample that has been split, polished, and would have been measured to a hundredth of a millimeter and the data fed into the um, computer so that hopefully out pops a felling date. This particular piece is the central part here. The acorn fell into the ground in 1407 and the tree was felled in the spring of 1576. Here is a tree uh, a timber being sampled and the skill, one of the many skills, is to go um, diagonally, what well, goes from the bark through to the center of the heartwood of the tree. At this house, the timbers were felled in the 1560s. Where did this take place? Only really in those parts of Northwest Wales where there were community groups willing to help with the research side of it where we could find volunteers to do the house histories. So these were several parts of Anglesey, those parts of Gwynedd called Arvon and Dwyvon, 
We had a specific grant from the Clean Peninsula and another from Afdidwi, which used formerly to be part of Murray Onishire. In Denbyshire, we worked in the area called Adernion, which previously again had been in Murray Onishire. And we worked in Conway. We raised about £150,000 in grants, a large heritage lottery grant, and then the 13,600 was the total of the three grants received from this society. So we were extremely grateful. And then another two dozen grants, which as those of you who've been involved in this sort of thing will know that means that I applied for at least another two dozen. It's quite a job, isn't it, getting money? We were able to count as cash equivalent or as match funding the time spent by volunteers the use of partners' facilities and the free use of partners' expertise. And that probably well, made at least another 117, perhaps 120,000 pounds. So one could say that this project has spent the equivalent of over a quarter of a million pounds. We worked in close partnership with various organisations, particularly the Royal Commission on Ancient Historic Monuments of Wales, based in Aberystwyth, whom I've already mentioned. And in fact, they wish to write a, a, a book with us on the results and their implications. We work closely with the National Trust on their old farmhouses, not their greater buildings, but on their old farmhouses in Northwest Wales. Cunal is the regional equivalent of the local authority schools advisory service. And we work with their humanities and IT officers and have produced an interactive bilingual um, learning resource for Key Stage 2 primary school children when they do the topic Tudor Homes and Houses. And then I mentioned that the Sheen area, there was a large landscape partnership scheme of which we became a smallish part. I hadn't heard of dendrochronology until about 2004 when I went to a VAG lecture and heard about this marvellous technique which was able to bridge the gap formed by opinions from architectural historians who had organised houses into consecutive orders of styles but could not tell you if a particular house was the first or the last of that style to be erected. And that could be 150 years difference in time. But dendrochronology can help. I also noticed that there were very few houses in northwest Wales that had been dated, very few in this area. So I raised a separate 20, 25,000 pounds, and we went round and got permission and dated the ones that had got a reddish blob, really centering on Snowdon, which is about here. These were mainly houses uh, in remote and quite high um, areas, and we were able to, to date almost all of those. That whetted my appetite, but I thought we need more because we were not doing building recording. We were not really recording the architectural detail, but partly because most of those houses were situated in the old Carnarvonshire and the Royal Commission had done a very detailed inventory of Carnarvonshire in the 1950s. So there were plans of most of those buildings. So a summary of the two projects together, I visited well over 300 houses, and it has been amazing how welcoming the owners or tenants have been. Very often I've called on announced usually started in Welsh if I thought it was probably Welsh people there, but then had to switch back to English to explain. I should think I've had under a dozen who have virtually shut the door in my face and said, we know it's an old house, but we don't want anyone else to come. We're not interested in its history, goodbye. So people generally are fascinated by the history of their own houses. Then along come the Occidentro team, and um, cut down the houses I think might be interesting to do by carefully assessing which ones are likely to date. 
So in the end, they dated, well, 94 to 100. And of those 75 yielded dates, five dated to before 1500. We had a number of hall houses, both crop framed and straight truss sitting on the top of the stone wall. We had many timber walled houses, timber framed houses, which we hadn't expected, and uh, as well as the stone walled houses. We found a brand new style, a transitional style. We found two houses in the 1530s that were half lofted, halfway between a hall house and a fully storied house. And I will show you pictures of those in a little while. Then we found, as we'd expected, masses of the storied stone-walled houses, but we realized that the earliest ones had a ladder to get upstairs, whereas the later ones had a spiral stone staircase in the gable end wall, a mural stair. We had well over 200 volunteers. 70 of those are still actively researching and do, doing further work. And we must have had over 30 on the range of committees dealing with the educational side, the IT, publications, the media, uh, all the things that you have to do. Uh, we had a tremendous amount of support. Now I'm going to move on to talk a bit about houses in North West Wales, having talked a bit about the process of the project. Here we have the typical homestead in hilly, rural, northwest Wales, possibly from the 7th, 8th, 9th century through to the 1400s. Subrectangular buildings, gable end into the hills. We've always had a problem with rain in North Wales. Stone footings, timber superstructure, organic roof. This is the dwelling house. We know that because the artist here has put a hole in the roof and there's plenty of smoke coming out. I dare say there's an awful lot left inside as well. So that is your typical um, farmstead. And those of you who are or were hill walkers will have seen many, many of these sub-rectangular banks of stone. The circular ones are earlier and you're seeing the stone footings of both domestic and agricultural buildings. I've come out of Wales into Shropshire for this, up to Magma Cottage, but we still have stone footing, timber superstructure here with the timber framing and an organic roof. Now this is the modern bit. This is from the 1400s. Inside there's a pair of crooks that are from the 13th century. 1269. Now that's almost a couple of decades before the Anglo-Norman invasion of Wales. And there is nothing like this in Wales at all. But we keep hoping we're going to find something really early. This is an interesting um, mound of stones now really in a bracken covered field excavated about 60 years ago, therefore not to, in the same way that it would have been done had it been done more recently. But it's a sub-rectangular house. The hearth is shown, the fire was on the floor. You have opposite doorway, oh, opposite doorways, and at the far end you have a service wing. So the high table would have been up here. Now we happen to know from documentation that this house was lived in in the late 1300s by an important family, one of the highest status families of this particular area. And we also know that the house was burnt down during the Owen Glyndor uprising, revolt, rebellion, depending which side you were on, around 1402. So we know that there were magnificent houses. We have the bards writing about them with their ornate timber work, but none of them survive any longer. Now I'm jumping to the castle towns of North Wales. Edward comes in at the end of the 13th century and 
quickly builds substantial stone castles and walled towns. And if you didn't know, you'd probably think this was a picture of Ludlow or Shrewsbury or somewhere like this. But it's Conway, in what one now thinks of as stone-built North Wales, Take, drawn about 1800. And the building on the left here is National Trust property. Formerly, I guess it would have been a merchant's house, a merchant's townhouse. And the dendro there gives a date of 1420. So pretty soon after the end of the Owen Glendore uprising, when rumour has it that virtually everybody bur burnt the other side's houses down, and anyway, following the plague and the famines of the previous century, they would be in a pretty poor condition. Houses then started being erected in the 1430s, 20s, and that sort of period in the towns. So there we have Conway. Moving on to Beaumaris, here's Beaumaris Castle of 1295, Castle Street, junction with Church Street, and most of the houses along here on both sides have the remnants of medieval buildings in them. If you walk into the Neptune Cafe and ask for ships, you are actually facing um, a, a, a Watland door wall. But that wasn't any good for dating. Here we have the, um, the 1480s solar of this wall house, and here we have an amazing building. Just looking at it from the other angle, this turned out to be the oldest house that we found. It's a first floor hall, quite likely downstairs was a stone built as the house in Conway, and the timbers up here were felled in 1483, a couple of years between Bo before Bosworth, about which we're hearing quite a bit these days. So that was an amazing find, really only discovered when the current owners moved in and wanted to do some substantial alterations. Here behind, we have another important building. Paul Davis, in his book, uh, Homes and Hearth of the, the Welsh House, this, has done this cutaway drawing of it as it would have been a little later, but the first part that we dated was here, and that dated to the 1540s. It does have wall paintings upstairs. I don't know what we were thinking about, but we didn't notice this little house for quite a while. And in the end, when we did, it was absolutely obvious that it was situated on a burgage plot going away from the main street. Timbers inside came out at two dates. So it's either a 1490s house with a 1515 extension at the back or it's a 1515 house using some old timbers. Not quite sure which. But having seen that shape, when we were looking in Carnarvon in the walled town there, it was very obvious that here is another gable end on a burgage plot. As we go inside this house, we find timbers that were actually felled in the winter of 1516-17. Now we dated this in two phases. First of all, we were allowed upstairs and they were all 1516-1506-7. And the owner who eventually let us look downstairs, we did some more, Martin did these, didn't you? And uh, again, it was the winter of 15.6.7. So all the timbers were gathered that winter and the house erected. Now, we nearly didn't have the opportunity to look in this house because about 20 years ago, it was in a very poor condition and the council bought it and were about to pull it down before that was stopped. Harach Castle. Yeah. Now, why am I showing you these two grotty semis? Because if you were to go in there, you have the smoke blackened timbers of a medieval hall house. The wind brace here is cusped, which is a signifies high status building. But unfortunately, being on the coast, the timbers were too fast grown to be dated. But from the style, it would seem to be very early 1500s. 
Now moving into the rural countryside, in fact I've moved away from North Wales, I'm in Radnorshire, because it's a good example of what I want to mention next. Again we have the stone footing, the timber superstructure, and probably here a wooden shingled roof, or thatched it more often than not in the north. We have a two bay hall, now, the fire would have been on the floor there, and the high table here, and the bench behind with the family and guests seated there. Servants, visitors, the hoi polloi, people from the community would come in one of these doors. Even a child knew to go in on the non-windy, non-wet side, and would turn into the hall and would see the amazing carpentry up here above the collar. Now there would be feasting, there would be business, there would be legal disputes sorted out here, because these were the houses of the gentry. These were not peasant houses, they were not even the middling farmer type, these were houses of the gentry. They were the most important type of house, and you might not even have one of these in each parish. After a meal, after business had been conducted, then the family and the visitors would go through into the solar, the parlour, and up a ladder, there would be a bedchamber. The other end, you've got the area for storage, food preparation, and all the jobs that have to be done. So this is the sort of pattern we've been looking at and finding. But of course, the fact that they're still standing, 99% of them, have been altered and they've got ceilings in awkward places and you don't, can't take pictures like that. But sometimes you can. Here is a hall house, now in St Pagans, at the National History Museum of Wales. Stone footings, timber framed, timber molly and window, no glass, too expensive, organic roof. In Inside, you have the smoke blackened, crook, crook framed building with the hearth on the floor and the entrance here through to the private quarters. 1508. This is the 1501 house, also in the Vale of Cluid, only about five or ten miles from the previous one, which is now in St. Cagans. But here it is in its original spot, and this is the one where you saw the young man drilling uh, right at the beginning. This would have been timber framed, and then a generation or two later, when fashions changed, a, a fireplace and a chimney, are, they are inserted centrally in the building. So this is 1501. Now we move to the heart of Snowdonia, very close to Snowdonia. Another crook frame building, half on the floor, goes into the private quarters, crook building, and here um, you have the very crook itself. This was felled in 1508, later cut off when a ceiling was inserted to make the farmhouse more useful. Here is the farmhouse. And then again, a generation or so later, um, from dating, when Henry VIII was still a slim young man, the fireplace and chimney were inserted, and you would then walk in, come round, and face a large Inglenook fireplace. So from 1508, this was the farm here. And amazingly, in this instance, we could trace documentary evidence back to 1508 for the ownership and tenancy and all sorts of information about this particular upland sheep farm. And then about 1920 a new house was built and so this is no longer needed as the farmhouse. Here is an elevation of another very early 1500s uh, crook frame building with lovely timbers here and a later inserted large fireplace, centrally inserted, and a spiral staircase. 
and here's a plan of this same building, near Blind of Castinio, a large sub-rectangular building and the fireplace now taking the place where the half would have been there on the floor originally. The owner very generously eventually let us date upstairs, but we weren't able to date as much as we'd like. So we've not found us out all that much yet about this particular building. Again, back to the heart of Snowdonia, near Abbot Laslin Pass, if you know the area, near Bedgallet, is this hall house dated to 1529. Again, it's a two-bay hall house, fire on the floor. Remember, these are not peasants, these are the gentry of the day here at their table, probably the richest people in the parish. And here you have the doorway through into their solar, their private quarters, and a ladder to get them upstairs. And here indeed is that doorway, 1529. Now, just to show that people can make mistakes very easily, all the books, very early books, say, well, it's obvious. This is a confessional into a Roman Catholic, in a Roman Catholic church. Therefore, this must be a church. Because they were not used back in the 1860s, at least not in Northwest Wales, to knowing what medieval houses really looked like. How did it happen that there was suddenly enough money for all this building? Well, it was, it was two things. It was you folk down in London, and it was cows. Because as the towns of the Midlands and the Southeast were growing rapidly, particularly in Elizabethan times, they had, people had to be fed. And so the drovers walked the cattle from the mountains, because they, marvellous creatures that they are, can turn these almost inedible looking stuff into lovely chunks of meat. So it was the cattle trade coming to London and the drovers seeing all these new designs and new buildings and everything that was happening, taking the money back, not in gold of course, it would have been too dangerous, but the beginning of the banks as IOU notes, that for the first time for a couple of centuries the people back in Wales had more money than they needed for subsistence. And therefore, it seemed to be the right time to be building and rebuilding houses. This is one of these transitional houses. Timber felled in 1532. The house is almost a thousand feet above sea level, again near Blyna Festiniog. And you will notice that it has two downstairs windows, but only one upstairs. In ground plan, you have the opposite doorways, and then to one side you have the preparation service storage rooms, but to the other side, you have a large room with a chimney. That is open to the roof. Where's the solar gone? It's now upstairs. So the private chamber, the bed chamber, has moved upstairs. So there is a staircase along the side of the wall, you go upstairs, hence you only need the window in that part of the building. This is the other one, built a year later and about 15 miles away, and we know actually that a drover's family were associated with this building. A magnificent crook, house here undergoing restoration. And this is how Falcon Hildred, a, a, an incredible artist, whose work has just been purchased by the Royal Commission for safekeeping, not, not our bits of work, but all the work he's done over the last few decades on particularly industrial scenes, before places were closed and stuff removed, marvellous work. Anyway, he has done these, this work for us. So you still have your opposite doorways, you still have your two doorways into your service area, and this one was probably for the stairs to go upstairs to the private area. May have had a hearth on the floor to start with, now it has a huge inglenook fireplace behind us. So, 1533. Around about the same period, or within five or ten years, a brand new style has appeared. Stonewalled, 
to store it completely. You still have the opposite doorways, the area into the food preparation, storage area here. But now you turn into the main room and you have a large ingle nook fireplace. To get upstairs on this totally storied house, you go up the ladder into the servants or the children's bedroom, walk through into the privacy of your bedroom, but that is above the cold storage area, but it's cold. So you had your own fireplace. This house was found um, actually being used as an agricultural building just outside Carnarvon, and here it is re-erected at St. Pagans. Here we're seeing it from the other end, where we have the jetted out, the corbling for the upstairs fireplace. Now the smoke doesn't mind what shape the chimney is. This is pure status, nor the height really. So it is just showing off. You have a larger window where you have the downstairs large fireplace because you need the light to see what you're doing. And a larger window in the chief bedchamber. You have a fan, a boussoir here of stones over the main door, although some have a one large stone, a cyclopean lintel there. So this is a date range building dated some time ago uh, to the 1540s to 50s. And this was thought to be the earliest of this type. That's why it was taken down, the stones numbered, and it was reassembled at St. Pagans. But this project has found that this sort of house goes back several decades earlier. Here's a house still in its original spot, and you can see the giveaway jetted out upstairs chimney. Huge fireplace here going down. If you look carefully, you can see the fan or the voussoir of stones over what was the original doorway, now superseded by this door. Obviously, this enlarged window is a replacement if you go up into the roof space there in that bedroom you see no sign of smoke blackening the fire was contained well mainly within the chimney smoke went up the chimney and therefore the upstairs rooms were smoke free and this was the beginning of much more privacy however they still retained the um, fancy wind brace here with the cusping as a high status symbol. And remember, these are still the houses of the gentry. These are the people who entertained the bards. Dated this house, 1548. And here's another of Falcon Hildred's um, reconstruction drawings. You can see both the 1548 house and the earlier house over here, crop framed, smoke blackened, possibly a smoke hood, um, an earlier dwelling, and then when the new generation took over here, it probably became the dower house. I think they've always been issues with mothers-in-law. Another of these types of houses, they were so fre uh, frequently found that they have been called the Snowdonia style. Stone walled, Ignore these dormer windows, probably a large, a high wall here. This is the jetting out for the fireplace. This one is en suite. You have a latrine chute here. Again, mid 1500s. And here is the uh, diagram from Peter Smith's work, Houses of the Welsh Countryside first published in 1975, when dendrodating hadn't really been done anywhere, of this sort of house. And here you have the spiral staircase. It's a typical house. You now know you're going to have opposite doorways. You've got the larger window here, so you're going to have the um, large inglenook fireplace in that wall and the spiral stone staircase. Here in another house, is the stone staircase looking down from upstairs and the little window that helped keep a bit of light in there. Now, when fashions changed and houses had wooden stairs, often when you walked in, you'd then be able to go up the stairs. These fell into disuse, they were blocked, and lots of them later became nicknamed priest holes. 
but actually the problem with Catholic priests and Protestantism was happening when these were still being used as staircases in most places. So I think myself it's very unlikely that many priests hid in these spiral stairs. We find that these really only come in the later part of the 16th century. The spiral staircase is the full-blown house of the Snowdonia style. Here is another one. This is the one from which that sample, that core was taken, and this is dated to 1579. Now, it had been derelict for some time, and when the owners were working on it, they got in touch with me and said, come and look what we found. At some stage, a farm building had been built against the back lateral wall. Therefore, this rear window in the main room was no longer needed or wanted, and so it was blocked. And when they took away the dry stone blocking, they found the diagonal mullioned window frame from probably the, the 1579 date of the erection of the house. Just in conclusion, don't always judge a book by its cover. I was giving a lecture in Denbyshire and a couple came up and said, oh, our house has got lots of timber like you've been showing. Would you like to come and see it? Well, the only answer really is yes, please. So I go along and as I drive up, I thought, oh dear, what am I going to find here? So I knew they had done a total restoration of the house before I got there. So here we go, upstairs, and bingo. They have got a pre-Elizabethan house. They took off layers and layers and layers of wallpaper, of um, boarding and different things that had covered the whole of this. They had no idea when they bought it. And this one was dated to the winter of 1552-53. So you never know what you're going to find. Now, on your seats, there are a couple of leaflets. One is, uh, they're bilingual, so if you picked up the Welsh side, don't panic, just turn it round. Um, one is about the project, in case you're interested, and the other one explains what we're doing now. These days, one has to have legacy. I'm sure in the old days, legacy meant things in the past, not the future, but anyway. So our legacy for this project goes into sort of at least um, three really three aspects. One is this particular group, the Updating Old Welsh Houses group, which was set up in uh, at Easter, last Easter, and now has about 100 members. We undertake research, we visit old houses, the quarterly newsletter lets everybody know what's happening, and we do lectures and study tours. Next week, we're going to South Wales, to St. Agnes and Cosmaston, medieval villages. So if you're at all interested and you want to keep in touch, please fill up one of those. Secondly, as a legacy, I've mentioned the interactive learning resources that are out in all the schools in Northwest Wales. And that's really important, I think, because linked with visits to some of these houses, that will help the youngsters put some reality into what sometimes can be boring, dead history. So we hope that is very successful. They have libraries and pictures and all sorts of things. I don't understand how it works, but the little ones do. And then, as I've mentioned, the Royal Commission want to write a book with us on the process, the results, and the implications. We have a website, which is given on these leaflets. And at a recent meeting, the website coordinator told us that we had had 306,000 hits in the last 12 months. I believe that's good. I don't know how many because we've got the word dating there, or gold, but to be serious, when the um, coordinator looked in more uh, detail, he found that the pages and the time spent on pages meant there has been a tremendous lot of interest. And we're planning to put the dendrochronology reports, the building record, recording reports, 
and the house history reports of all these 70 to 80 houses onto the website uh, within the next few months. This project has already shown that contrary to previous thought, Northwest Wales was no architectural backwater, but in fact was to the forefront of innovative building techniques in Tudor in the Tudor and Elizabethan period. Thank you.